This edition of Mac Voices is brought to you by Drobo. Simple, safe, expandable storage for your data. To get $90 off a of Drobo Gen 3, Drobo 5D, or Drobo 5N, visit drobostore.com and use the offer code HOLIDAYCHUCK. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is a talk of the Mac community. I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, we have uh, something a little different this time around. We've got a, a, a tag team of authors who have put together a new book, one that I think you're going to be very interested in, The Connected Apple Family. Uh, and I'll let you let them tell you about exactly what it is. Um, but first up, and I'll do it as uh, they appear on my screen, Mr. Jeff Carlson. Jeff, it's great to have you back. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having us on. Congratulations for this. This is a good, good book. Thank you. It is a good book. I'm excited about it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And for his first time since I can't believe it, 2008, I had to go back and look it up, Mr. Dan Morin. Dan, it's great to see you finally. You, you look older. Oh, thank you. Yeah, a pleasure to be back. Pleasure yeah. to be back. I, I think I had hair last time yeah. I was on this podcast. <laughs> I have to go back and look at the picture. I really am not sure about that, but yeah. Probably, probably not, probably not. Yeah. So you two co-authored this, um, and I, I think that, that's great. How did I, I guess I should ask, though, how did the collaboration come about? Because usually you guys tend to run a little more solo. Well, Jeff can tell you because he uh, <laughs> he started out, he started out my with story. the project <laughs> and brought me on. Okay, yeah, exactly. So, so the 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 origin of this project was um, uh, at WWDC earlier this year. Apple announced iOS eight, um, uh, family sharing, Yosemite, and just really by. Coincidence, I was talking to my editor, uh, Cliff Colby at Peach Pit, and he's like, you know, hey, what do you think of the new things? And, you know, I was just kind of riffing off the top of my head. I was like, well, it's kind of interesting how all these things work together. And wouldn't it be interesting to, to do a project that talked about not just, you know, iOS 8 or a new iPad or a new iPhone or whatever, but, you know, how do you make these things work together? Because a lot of us have separate devices. We'll have, you know, maybe uh, a Mac and an iPhone or a Mac and an iPhone and an iPad, or, you know, some people start with an iPhone, then they pick up an iPad. And a lot of the collaborative features of, of the new versions of the operating system are really designed so that you can make those things work together. And it was really just sort of a, you know, hey, wouldn't this be kind of a crazy idea? And I think within a day or two, he got back to me saying, we love this. Let's turn it into a book. I'll, you know, give you an offer. And so we were sort of off and running by then without even having an outline or anything, which is very rare <laughs> the way things work in, in, in book publishing. Um, and so... Uh, you know, it, it, it was great to be able to to start to dig into this whole ecosystem or uh, geek ecosystem, as a friend of mine said when I tried to explain the concept um, of uh, you know how do you make all these things work together? And um, the the reason I brought Dan on, um, I guess it was sort of fortunate timing that MacWorld decided to. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, dispense with a lot of its its actual quality people, um, and so um, I was also um, probably about mm, I would like ears deep in another book project, and there was no way that I could also do this and hit the the, the deadline that that Peach Pit needed. So I was like, all right, who do I know who could jump into this immediately? Knows the material back and forth. And um, so I reached out to Dan and I said, hey, I'm, I'm doing this thing. And would you be interested in writing a nice giant hunk of the book? <laughs> and, I thought uh, you, you reached out to some people and none of them were available. So <laughs> you gave me. <laughs> <laughs> I reached out to half of Apple. And, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that well, from my case. perspective, it was very, it was, as Jeff said, very fortunate timing as I recently left Macworld and needed some something to do, if nothing else. Um, and so having a, a nice big project to sink my teeth into was, was great as someone who, you know, obviously has been 
lived, breathed, and eaten the Apple ecosystem for the last uh, eight years or more. Uh, probably, really, probably my entire life. It's perfect material for me, and as I have a vested personal interest in it as well as someone like you guys, I'm sure, who has 8,000 Apple devices. Because I always want to figure out what are the best ways that I can get these things to work together, and how can I make this experience really seamless. So for me, that was kind of a, a perfect storm. I mean, that's great because I can't think of two people better to tackle this. And this has been a bit of a pain point for Apple users. The, the idea that Apple Apple devices have kind of been solo devices. You know, it's it's my Mac and it's and of course then we had multiple users come along in OS ten, which turned it into our Mac. We don't have multiple users for the iDevices though, and there's still some issues, you know, with trying to share machines, share accounts, and all that, and especially when it came to iTunes and buying apps and buying music. Um, so I guess Peach Pit probably recognized that there was a pain point here and jumped on it right away when Apple provided a solution. The question I have for you two is: Did they provide the solution? How fully formed is it at their first uh, time at bat with this? I think they've provided. A lot of solutions. Um, <laughs> I think that that um, to be honest, I, I would say they've done a pretty good job. There's a lot of stuff that works together. Um, I can't say it's all seamless because a lot of it. Um, I hate to sort of you know start off on a bad foot, but um, you know a lot of it relies on iCloud, and for some people, iCloud is wonderful. And for some people, iCloud is a you know big frustration, and sometimes you can't really do anything about it because it's you know, it, it's all on Apple's end. Um, so you know, I, I think that that sort of illustrates the 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 pain point aspect of it of um, you know being able to run into a situation. It's like okay, my calendars aren't sharing. Why is that? And what can I do to to to, to make that work? Um, you know, I think a lot of the, the the family sharing stuff that Apple introduced, which lets you have a group of of people in a sort of you know family, um, and be able to purchase items from the iTunes Store under one uh, credit card account. Like a, a lot of that is new and seems to work fairly well, but you know you run into just odd things here and there. I think, um, you know, the, uh, iCloud photo sharing, which is, um, still officially a beta, you know, has some kinks to work out and things like that. Dan, how about your experiences as, as you, obviously, as you went through the book, you did a lot of testing, yeah. pretty, pretty seamless or, um, like Jeff says, I think the interesting thing about iCloud again is, you know, if you go back to the introduction of iCloud several years ago, even though it's got this one monolithic name, iCloud, there's really a bunch of different technologies in there for everything from sharing your documents to syncing your contacts and calendars. And so having all those different fragmented services means that even though the branding seems to suggest it's just one thing, everything's in the cloud, uh, it turns out that it's not always that seamless. So there's a little bit of a curve in terms of trying to make everything work together in a in a fashion that lets you jump back and forth between your devices or make sure that things stay in sync on all of your devices. So from our perspective, it certainly did take a lot of testing. I think, I, I don't know about Jeff, but I certainly was, felt like, oh, wow, this is great, a great ground. They've laid some great groundwork here, but mm -hmm. it needs to be polished. It needs to be smooth. And I guess fortunately for us, it means that we need to explain some stuff and that people can learn something from our book. <laughs> You know, you would think that this is a pretty simple thing, but it, when you start to dig into it and really think about it, it's it's not. Just like syncing is not easy, this whole family sharing, connecting different devices and having different accounts and all is not necessarily easy. And so I, I agree with you. I think that it de definitely helps to have you guys guide folks through it, especially since it seems like it can be a little difficult to reverse something once you've kind of started it. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, one of the things about Apple, and I think, you know, to its detriment as well as uh, to its benefit, is you know people expect things to just work, and Apple tries to make things so that they just work. And you know, I think for the most part that that that's kind of the case. Um, but there are sometimes you know things that you run into that you know that sound really great and just don't work for some reason. Um, like like one one of the great cool features is um, handoff. 
And what Handoff lets you do is, let's say you're uh, composing an email on your iPhone and you get back to your, your desk and back to your computer before you're done writing it, you can just um, basically just hand that off to the, the Mac and continue writing in, um, in the mail app. And so, you know, like, like it's, it's, it's very seamless, but it turns out that you really have to have like, um, you know, a, a computer, a Mac that was made in the last couple of years that has the right hardware, um, that, that, that supports the, the protocols that they're using. Um, and you know, like one little tiny gotcha, and maybe I'm bringing this up because it, it hit me. Um, you know, the, the 2011 Mac mini has the the correct uh, Bluetooth hardware, and, and Bluetooth is is integral to making this work. It has the correct Bluetooth hardware, um, and you know I spent I don't know how many hours trying to fi- you know make this thing work. It never worked, never worked, never worked. And then it turns out that oh, actually that specific model uh, it's just not supported. Like like there's some other component inside uh, that that doesn't work. Um, so I had to co-opt my my wife's. Uh, uh, 2013 MacBook Pro and try not to mess anything up on that and get into big trouble um, in order to, to do some testing. So, you know, like there are little, I don't know, pockets that you might run into that are like, okay, like why isn't this working? Or, uh, you know, do I really have to just completely sign out of iCloud on a device in order to reset things, stuff like that? Yeah, and even in cases where it, things work, sometimes they work a little too well. I'm thinking in particular of the ability um, to get phone calls relayed from your iPhone to your other devices like your iPad and your Macs. And as I've learned recently, whenever I happen to be sitting around, sometimes on a podcast, and my phone starts ringing, all of a sudden every device in my house starts ringing. And you're, you're sort of scattering around going like, wait, how do I shut this up? And so, you know, that's a, it's a great a system. And it's, it works really well when you actually sit down and use it. But there are definitely some annoyances in terms of dealing with, okay, maybe the success is here is a little bit too widespread. There are too many devices causing problems now. <laughs> and it's not even really obvious like how to turn that off. You, you, can, right. you can make it so that the you know, iPad doesn't pick up those calls, but it's not obvious in the slightest. But it, it is if you read our book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had that experience where I'm at the office. My iPad is in my, my pack. I'm in the conference room. And somebody comes in and says, excuse me, but your backpack is ringing. <laughs> it's like, oops, yeah, that's not going to work. Um, you know, I think we, we sort of jumped right in here. I'm going to go back and just ask you to sort of give me the high level of this book. The Connected Apple Family, uh, that, that has a lot of implications here. And it sounds like what we're talking about right now, at least at this point, is managing multiple devices for my with my Mac, my Mac, my iPhone, my iPad. But do you get into some of the family sharing stuff and all that Apple has implemented? Oh yeah, definitely. Um I mean I think family sharing was really sort of the the impetus for for making this book happen. Um and so like the first chapter, and I can just do a little uh, visual plug Ooh, for people watching this on video. We have a book. Um, we have a book. Um, you know, the, the first chapter is all about um, setting up family sharing because there are some things that, that ripple uh, further down uh, into the content of the book. Um, once you have that set up, it's not essential. You don't have to set it up. But, um, you know, th- there, there are features that build upon that. Um, so, you know, we, we cover that. Um, but then, like, we wanted to take a real sort of task-based approach. So not just, you know, okay, here's a feature and here's how it works and here's a menu item and here's how it works. You know, we wanted to say like, okay, you know, one very obvious thing that you're going to be doing with your devices is you're going to be communicating. So, you know, we go into detail on, you know, text messaging and, um, you know, sending media over texts and FaceTime and um, a, a lot of those things that someone you know, like maybe they've kind of scratched the surface of, maybe they have no idea that like, for example, um, if you have an iPhone, you can very quickly just um, uh, press and hold the, the uh, camera button in iMessage and um, send a photo like without even, you know, doing anything more than, than pressing the, the button and then letting go of it. And that sends a photo to somebody, you know, little things like that, that 
um, you may never have run into if you're just casually, you know, thumbing through the controls. Yeah, and, and to take it broader than that, like like Jeff said, I think we really approach this from a feeling of, well, you know, we've all got family, and a lot of our family have all these different devices. And for me, especially having, um, you know, a larger family that is far flung, doing things like, all right, maybe my cousins live in, you know, upstate New York, but I want to keep in touch with them, as I often do. And these days, that means things like iMessage, or it means things like multi-party video chats. And so having that ability to say, all right, you, you want to keep in touch with your family, even though they're far away. And if they're all using Apple devices, you can easily do this in, in this fashion. And even if you don't want to go down the route of doing family sharing, as Jeff mentioned, there are still a lot of options and a lot of workarounds that you can use to duplicate a lot of those same features. We run you through some of the abilities to share calendars, for example, without family sharing, or share your location with other family members without necessarily setting that up. So even though Apple simplified some of it, we want to make sure that it's accessible to everybody who's not just you know decided to use this latest and greatest new feature. Because as we all know, lots of our family don't always upgrade to the latest and greatest immediately. So we want to make sure no family member left behind. Exactly. Well, and also, and I'm sure you've you've all run into this, and probably everybody watching this, um, you know, like there are often family members and and you know and friends who need some help, um, and because you happen to know how to do all this stuff, you're the the dedicated um, you know help person. So you know, we go into things like like screen sharing and controlling somebody else's screen remotely. Um, because if you've ever had that wonderful experience of trying to guide somebody through their Mac interface over the phone, having them, you know, tell you, okay, like, what do you see on the screen now? Click that, this thing. No, no, not that thing. Don't jump ahead. You know, like that sort of stuff, they're, they're, that aspect of, of communication and, and connectivity is also, you know, a very important part of working with a, a, a greater family. Um, I would also say that um, we have a, a big section on um, passwords and security because, you know, this is the modern age and, you know, I'm sure lots of people in your family have no sense of good security. They're, you know, they have one password for everything and it's the name of their dog. And so, you know, we, we go into detail about, you know, how to set up iCloud keychain syncing and even um, using the, the app 1Password. Uh, which has a really interesting feature. You can have uh, shared password archives. So, for example, if you're the person who uh, basically is, you know, manages all of the the computer and uh, infrastructure for your family, whether that's somebody in your house or somebody you know in another state, um, you know, you can set up a a shared vault that lets you access their passwords, obviously, if they trust you and give you permission. Um, and so, or maybe not, you know, if, if, <laughs> if, 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 if they really need that much help. Um, and, and so that, you know, if they were to go into one password and change their, you know, bank password or whatever, and then forget it or can't reach it or whatever, you can have access to that information without having them, you know, give it to you on a semi-regular basis or whatever. So there are a lot of a lot of you know um, helpful things like that, where you can help other people without having to start at ground zero and sort of have to like figure out where you're both at in terms of shared knowledge. It it still blows me away, and, and this is a little bit of an aside, but in today's world, that people still don't understand the need for these passwords or what they should even look like. And and I say this because just today, as we record this, I was setting up a new email account for someone at the office, and I handed them their password on a piece of paper and said, "Here it is." And they looked at me and like I had two heads and said, "What is this?" I said, "It's it's it's your password." And of course, it's completely randomized with punctuation and everything. And I said, "How mm -hmm. am I supposed to remember this?" Well, you're supposed to use you know a password manager. Well, how do I do that? And it's like you know up till now. And, and it was only 15 characters. I said, you know, I could have gone up to 30, <laughs> and, which at that point. And they, next time I will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, Count yourself lucky. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's just amazing that, you know, people don't get it yet. Well, and it's really important. And as Jeff says, I think a lot of us deal with people who, who don't, who take the convenience over security. And, and we're not always going to be able to convince those people to take a 15 character randomized password. But what we can hopefully do is find some me middle ground. So it's, it's not as insecure as just your 
dog's name opens everything in your life. But it, it maybe is a little bit easier for some of the less technically savvy among us to actually create passwords that are hard for other people to guess and hard to get hacked. Um, and so, you know, finding that that middle ground between um, you're trying to help your family members and you don't want them to not invite you to Thanksgiving because you've given them all 30 character passwords that they can't <laughs> remember. Um, but they still aren't going to come to you and been like, oh, I got hacked. Well, what was your password? Well, it was password, but it had a one after it, you know, so <laughs> I think that's important. Yeah, that's that, that helped a whole lot right there. No question. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, and also I think um, not to harp too much on security, but, um, you know, one of the things that people think is, well, my data is not important. Nobody wants to hack me. You know, like like I'm not really a target. And of course, the the real life answer to that is, well, no, you're not a target. But if you went to target and used your credit card there, your information has been exposed by hackers, you know, attacking corporations and banks and things like that. So, you know, whether you like it or not, you need to do something more than just the base level of security. And fortunately, these are things that you can do. You can, you know, set up iCloud uh, Keychain so that when you go and log into your bank, Safari can autofill those passwords, not just on your Mac, but also on your iPhone or your iPad, uh, because it's it's storing all of that securely and um, making it easy for you to to put it in. So that that's sort of helpful stuff too. Is is this a case, Dan, of the world has uh, well, not the world, but Apple? You know that the well, the world has become so sophisticated. We have so many different ways to communicate, so many channels. Apple's trying to address all those needs and wants, and there's just no way to make some of this stuff simple because everybody seems to want their particular grain of control. It's, in some cases, it's a very fine grain. Other times, it's a very rough grain. Some people want no control. Some people want absolutely total control. How do you feel like they've they've addressed that? Well, you know, it's tricky, especially for Apple, because Apple's so vaunted for like, well, this is the way you do things, and this is the only way you do things, and we'll tell you the best way to do things. But I think it's it's nice that they have provided a, a number of different manifest uh, mechanisms for dealing with these kinds of things, and so it is possible to sort of scale yourself up and down and figure out just how complex something is, and and I. I think in particular, you know, when it comes to the book, we we try to go over a lot of different options and say, like, here's a way you can do something. I'm thinking in particular of something like backups. You know, we say, well, you know, Apple gives you the ability to do backups with Time Machine. And that's great. If that's all you do, that's a great start. Now, you know, like Jeff was saying, same thing with security. That's not going to do it for everyone. And and we recommend, like, you know, that might not do it for you if you're worried about other other secure other backup issues. For example, if you have all your backup drives in your house, that might cause a problem if, say, God forbid, your house burns down or you get flooded like those poor people out in San Francisco right now. You know, there's a lot of uh, different levels of backup that you can do to go all the way from being like, well, I don't back up at all, but uh, all the way up to I have offsite backups and multiple redundancy and all of this. And that's not going to work for everyone, as you're saying. There, it's nice that there's a, a range of options. And so we walk people through some various things they can do. My personal favorite you know, tip sort of for that kind of thing is even, you know, you have a time machine, and that's great. But, you know, making an offsite backup, which sounds really sort of scary and technical and very complicated, is like, well, all you do is you make a backup on an external hard drive. And then the next time you go over to your you know, mother's house or your brother's house, your friend's house, you simply just leave a copy of that drive there. Um, and if they happen to also have a copy of our book and have done the same thing, you just exchange drives every time. And that's a very simple way to create an offsite backup. It doesn't require a lot of extra work. It doesn't require really anything in the way of extra money or anything like that. So having the option to say, yeah, I want really fine grain control because I really want to make sure that my data is, is safe at all times and that I'm, I'm backed up as securely as I can be, um, all the way down to people who are just like, you know, I, I don't have anything that's super critical, but I do want to keep a backup of my stuff. So Time Machine might work for me. Um, so I think it is tricky that that Apple in, in and of itself doesn't always give you that ability to sort of run the gamut of options. But there are a lot of great third party tools and a lot of great techniques you can use that help you, you know, figure out what's the right backup solution for you. And, and we try to walk you through a lot of those options. Mac Voices is sponsored by Drobo. Simple, safe, expandable storage for your data. I'm thrilled to welcome Drobo back as an active sponsor of Mac Voices. Why? Because it gives me a chance to make sure you understand why Drobo is my personal mass storage device of choice and why it should be yours too. If you have a Drobo, your data is about as safe as you can make it, 
because you can set up your Drobo to guard against one or even two different drive failures. If that happens, you don't lose any data, you simply replace the drives and keep going. Not only is your data secure, but you can keep on accessing and working with it during the process. Drobo is simple because, well, it's simple. The Drobo dashboard software has all the controls you need to name, rename, partition your Drobo, and more. And understanding the status of the Drobo is simple too. A green light beside a drive bay means all is good. A yellow means you're running out of space and either need to delete some files or upgrade the drive to one with more capacity. A flashing red light means that something has gone horribly wrong with the drive and it needs to be immediately replaced. Of course, you also get regular alert notifications on your Mac, but the lights make it easy for you to see what's going on at all times. And a row of blue lights along the bottom indicates just how full your Drobo is. So at a glance, you know how much data you're storing and protecting. And expandable goes along with simple. You can add more storage to your Drobo at any time without even having to turn it off. All the work is done with tools you're very familiar with, your fingers. Lift off the magnetically attached faceplate and you have access to the drives. Push the tab beside the drive to pop it out, slide it out of its bay, slide another one in, and replace the faceplate. That's all there is to it. You now have even more safe, secure data storage. This time though, I want to tell you about the newest Drobo, the Drobo Generation 3, a 4-bay model that is the most popular, affordable Drobo yet. First, you get everything I just talked about. Simplicity, safety, and expandability. You also get USB 3 speed so that moving all that data around doesn't take all day. You also get a new dual-core microprocessor so the Drobo operations themselves are faster. And you can also set up the Drobo Gen 3 to protect your data against the unlikely event of two different drives failing at the same time. Taking safety one step further, Drobo have also included an internal battery and a small SSD cache to help store data being written if the power fails. It's those little touches that make Drobo such a great product. If you're already a Drobo owner and want to upgrade to the new Drobo Gen 3, there's no need to spend a lot of time copying data. Just move your disk pack from your old Drobo into the new one, fire it up, and you get to enjoy the power of the new Drobo with no delay. You can get a Drobo Gen 3 right now for $349 but I can do better than that for you. If you go to drobostore.com and use the code HOLIDAYCHUCK, all uppercase, all one word, from now through midnight on December 29th, you can get your new Drobo Gen 3 for $90 off. That's $259 for the Gen 3 Drobo with USB speed, a dual core processor, and all the safety, simplicity, and expandability the Drobo offers. You just won't find a better deal on storage. Get it now and protect all those holiday photos and videos you're taking, or all the work you did this year that's just sitting there waiting for something to happen. Again, that's drobostore.com and the code HOLIDAYCHUCK, all one word in all uppercase, to get $90 off the Gen 3, the Drobo 5D, or 5N until midnight, December 29th. Just think of me as Santa's little elf. The photo should convince you. Or not. Oh, and if you feel lucky, you can go to drobo.com slash macvoices and register to win a free Gen 3 Drobo. You must enter by midnight December 31st, and winners can be picked during the first week of January. But you'll have to compete with me for that, because I could really use another Gen 3 Drobo. Just because. Get your Drobo now, save $90 with the code HOLIDAYCHUCK, and give yourself, or someone you love, the gift of Drobo. Thanks to Drobo for their support of Mac Voices. Jeff, I wanted to go back to one thing you said, uh, your experience with having hardware that was not compatible. Did, have you done any research? Is there a way, f for example, with that particular Mac, since it doesn't have the right Bluetooth, to buy, a, say, a Bluetooth dongle or something and, and help make it compatible? From what I understand, there are um, like thir third-party Bluetooth dongles, but they don't work um, to enable this. Um, there is a... Uh, there's a, a command line hack, and I'm forgetting what it is right now. That that for like maybe two or three models, in, including Sorry, mine, it's a kernel extension, I think. Kernel extension, thank you. Yeah. Um, it's a command line hack. There's like yeah. a, there's a, there are hackers, and they. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this. Sorry. Is, yeah. No, it's I was I, I was watching the trailer for that 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 new um, uh, Chris Hem, Hemsworth movie that looks terrible. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, so th there's a kernel extension that will enable it, um, and you know it's it's 
you know, potentially sort of brittle and it's unsupported and, you know, you, you run it at your own risk. But um, I, I installed it just fine in a uh, an early version of, of Yosemite um, just to test it on that machine and it worked. So there are workarounds, but, um, you know, I, I don't think that there are, are – a lot of really reliable ones, and I haven't heard of any any third party Bluetooth um, uh, dongle or or add on that works yet. Yeah. So it's, it, I mean, that may be as good a reason as any to buy the book to find out if your <laughs> machine. Well, I'm serious to find out if your yeah. machine does everything because that could save you a lot of time and trouble trying to work your way through a problem. If you know, if if you just automatically know that okay, this Mac doesn't support this feature, period, move on. Yeah. Any surprises? I, I love to ask that question of authors. When you were doing all this research, anything that surprised you uh, that kind of came out of left field, good or bad? <laughs> Dan, I, you, you're smiling uh, evilly. I, you know, <laughs> there's always surprises because I think there's always things that we we learn uh, as authors when we're doing when we're setting things up. Um, I actually found a um, a few things in uh, you know Jeff was talking about security and I did some of the research on security I must have set up iCloud keychain about 17,000 times <laughs> um, so I you know one of the things that I thought was really handy that I that I learned about that was that um, and I think Apple does prompt you to, to do this when you set up iCloud keychain you can approve it from other devices so if I set up iCloud keychain on my Mac and then I go to set up, up on my iPhone. You have a couple different options. The sort of way it prompts you to do it is say like, oh, go to your Mac and say, uh, okay, uh, my this iPhone can use our can access my iCloud keychain, which is great. But if you're not in your house where your Mac is, or you don't have another device with you, and I found that there was a bug at the time that would constantly turn iCloud keychain off, so I was re-enabling it every every couple of days. Uh, and it turned out that there's also the ability to just set a security code, like a four-digit PIN, that lets you sort of authorize that. And so that turned out for me to be a lifesaver because I would be out of the house and be like, oh, I can't autofill this password because my keychain's not syncing. All right, I got to turn the keychain syncing on. Well, I don't have another device right here to approve it with. Okay, I can put in the security code. So finding those little redundancies and things, is it's nice to know that Apple is considered. Maybe we don't all have 17,000 devices at our disposal at all times, um, but there, there are often workarounds. And we tried to suss out what a lot of those would be. And also, I think uh, that sometimes at, at your peril, didn't didn't your computer uh, completely lock you out for a while? Oh yeah, yeah, that was a good one. Uh, I was yeah. testing, I was testing the uh, Find My Mac, um, Find My iPhone, Find My Mac, that kind of stuff, oh, right. and. Um, so I went into the the web interface for it, and I was like, okay, well, if I just lock it, I can I can unlock it by putting in like whatever password or code I specify. And so I, I locked it, and then for some reason, because again the version of OS 10 I was using, I think it, I'm trying to remember if I was using still a beta build of Yosemite on it at that point, <laughs> but I think I think I was. And so I went and I you know it locks it and it restarts to a gray screen. And it's supposed to show up with this little like screen for inputting a password, except it would never get to that point. It would just get to a gray screen and keep spinning forever. And I was like, uh, did I just lock myself out of my entire computer? I think I did. So I had to spend an hour or two trying to figure out ways around that, uh, eventually requiring me to boot into internet recovery to even get to a like screen where that password prompt would show up. At which point I heaved a big sigh of relief, wiped my brow, and said, "Never testing that again." But it definitely works. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, Dan and I are on opposite sides of of, of the United States, and so uh, he tweeted something about, you know, oh, this is not not pleasant, and I think I shared a screenshot, and I was like, "Oh my God, I know exactly what he's doing, and it's my fault." <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. I saw that and wondered what what had happened. Yeah. I saw that, Dan. Yeah, it turns out that it's, it's a great system, but at that point, maybe not the best thing to test on pre-release hardware that or pre-release software that could brick your hardware. So everything worked out fine, which was great, but I just want people to know the extents to which Jeff and I go <laughs> researching the data in our book because we, we leave no MacBook unturned. Yeah. That's true. And and also, I think we are now uh, experts at, at making Apple IDs, at least I am, because I had to, to invent children of my own for uh, uh, creating family share sharing groups and, um, you know, lots of, lots of two factor authentication. And, um, uh, one of the things that, that I learned, um, and you know, one of the sort of, uh, uh, complications, if you want to move to family sharing, uh, it's basically 
Here's the thing about Apple. Apple's like, all right, we have this new thing, and we're just going to assume that you're starting from zero, and you'll just do the thing the way we designed the thing. Um, so in this case, let's say you have, you, let's say you set up a, an Apple ID for one of your kids, but um, before family sharing, there was no way to do like a, a student ID um, or, or like a, a kid's ID. Um, and because of, of actual um, uh, legal ramifications, there's like a, a age 13 cutoff that, that you can now set up a, a child ID. Well, what do you do with your kid's ID from before that, you know, basically thinks that they're an adult. Well, there's a little hacky thing where you go in and you say that their, their, uh, birth date is, I think January 1st, 2001 or something like that. Um, and it makes them 13. And so then that they can be considered a child on your account so that you can do things like have, um, uh, there's a feature where it's called, um, ask to buy. And if your your child wants to buy something or or buy an in-app purchase, you have to approve it. Well, you could either set them up with an entirely new Apple ID, child ID, or you can convert them over to this sort of quasi child ID and then get that to work. So that was like one of those sort of out of left field. How are we going to address this issue? And it turns out you you'd be a little sneaky and hopefully. Apple's cool with that and isn't like we did what? So. <laughs> yeah, they uh, Apple doesn't really like. They tend to think, as Jeff is saying, that everything kind of exists in a in a vacuum, and that like all of us will be in this perfect blank tabula rasa, and then we will start <laughs> using their technology. and And I think you know part of the reason that this does involve so much testing on our parts is that everybody's setup is a little bit different. Um, and obviously, even with that, there's only so much we can test. But we try really hard to try and duplicate all of the, you know, a lot of those common situations that you might run into, like Jeff was just describing. So, yeah, Je uh, it, Apple's Apple's technology doesn't always uh, really survive contact with the enemy user, whatever you want to call it. Well, and all of us in the outside world are fabulous beta testers. And and if, if you've worked with with Apple software for any length of time, you know that sometimes, you know. Like no one really outside of Apple spent much time with this, and so you know you get an update later on that addresses things. And again, to go back to this, some of this you would think would be really simple, but then you then you think about it, and I've seen plenty of articles and people come to me and complain that uh, you know you kids grow up, um, people get divorced, you know, then somebody has custody of the child, and you know who gets custody of the child, who gets custody of the apps. You know, is what it amounts to. Uh, you know, who, when is a family no longer a family? What is a family? It, it it can it can get a little crazy. So it's no wonder at times that some of this stuff isn't fully baked. I think they're probably still trying to figure it out, look for use cases, and establish policies that okay, this is the way this will work. At some point, you almost have to implement a sense of order, or you'll go crazy. I think I don't know. You tell me. Have you two gone crazy? <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, we've gone crazy a long time Certifiably. ago. Certifiably, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Actually, a, a lot of that stuff um, I was surprised to find that, that you just mentioned. Um, Apple has uh, addressed, like for example, um, and it, uh, see if I can get this right uh, from memory without consulting my book, because when you write a book, it all goes into the book and out of your head. Um, you know, if if you have a situation where um, like, like like a child is is going to the custody of another parent, there's a mechanism in place where. Um, like you can't just remove a child from your family group, but you can transfer the child to a different family group. Um, so you know, like some of those you know real world practical um, situations have been addressed. I'm sure not all of them, but um, I was rather impressed to see that they're like, oh, okay, like somebody either you know had to deal with that, or you know they spec'd it out, um, anticipating things like that. Yeah, lot to anticipate. A lot to anticipate, just like you were saying. Oh, I, and um, I, I wanted to go back to the family sharing for a second and how much depth you get into in that. We, we're talking about that here now. Um, but what's your opinion of, of how well it's implemented on maybe a, on a percentage basis? Do you think it's 80% baked, 100% baked, 90%? I would say, uh, um, I mean, I would say like 80%. Um, 80, 
eighty-five percent. Um, you know, like there was a little bit of confusion uh, getting it set up, and I think partially that was also due to the fact that you know when we were first setting it up, it was um, you know while the the features were still in beta. Um, but uh, you know, what's what I find interesting about family sharing is you sort of have to. If you want to adopt it, you have to fully adopt it. You can't just say, well, I'm going to have a little bit of family sharing um, and then do a lot of other stuff. Because, like, for example, um, you know, in your family group, if you set yourself up as the family organizer, which is the, the title, makes you sound like the godfather or something, um, you know, like you provide a credit card and that credit card is used by everybody. So if, let's say, your spouse, already has a bunch of, of um, music and a bunch of stuff that she's purchased on her own and you know doesn't want to use a shared credit card that becomes a difficulty and, and, and maybe then you know she shouldn't be in the family group or um, you know maybe you need to get a new credit card that can be shared among the family if everybody has you know, like their own single ones so um, you know it's it seems to work well. And I'm sure somebody right now is like, that's not my experience at all. You're crazy. <laughs> oh, and that's the trouble um, with all these different family situations like we're talking about. Yeah. There are a lot of things that don't fit neatly into the boxes that Apple's provided. And so, you know, providing workarounds insofar as you can, you can't obviously duplicate all the features of family sharing because, you know, so a lot of that is dependent on technology Apple's made available sort of behind the scenes there. Um, but I think, and I think there's even some more complexity with, you know, what things that you have bought, you can actually share because not everybody mm -hmm. is given the rights to Apple to say, sure, share this with your entire family. Um, and so navigating some of that is still a little bit thorny, uh, but it's a great, it's a great idea. I think we definitely agree. Like the, the, the groundwork has been laid, um, and there's a lot of potential stuff that you can definitely do with it right now. But I, I, I think, you know, Apple will continue to sort of roll that out and we'll get that last 15% hopefully in the, in the next year or two. Yeah, definitely. I mean, as another example, I think some of it is a little sort of, uh, uh, Kludgy and engineery. Um, like, for example, um, one of the, the, the standout features of family sharing is if I buy a song, um, I can share that with anybody in the family. They don't have to repurchase it or, or whatever. Um, but in order to actually get that song, um, at first I just assumed that it was going to be like, um, 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 and I've just forgotten the name of the feature... Mm, iTunes, uh, never mind. Um, this is what happens when you stare at yourself live. It's in the book. Um, it's in the book. It's yeah. In the book. <laughs> anyway, I assumed that uh, you know that all of those songs would just appear on my device, um, and then I could just play it. Well, that's actually not the case. What you have to do is you have to go into um, you know say iTunes and select the other member of the family and see what things they have purchased. And if you want one of those things, then you have to download and, and put it on your device. You can't just stream it. And so, you know, it's, it could definitely be made smoother. And um, I fully expect that it would. It just has that sort of feel of, okay, Apple ran out of time to make this pretty or to make this elegant, but it works and we're going to ship it. You know, you know, I've heard a couple scenarios like that and people that are happy for that because they don't want – it doesn't become a big pool of stuff um, because, you know, you don't want your, your daughter's bubblegum pop in with your heavy metal. Just because it's you're all in the same pool, you almost want to say, oh, yeah, I think I'll, I'll take that song for whatever reason. Um, and she maybe can take your song. You don't want to expose her to everything you're listening to. So, yeah, it's – it, it is a complex, again, you, you would think it would be simple, but it, there are a lot of things that need to be considered. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> we have considered many of them. Mm, yes, very, very well, considerate. It, you know, the, the more we talk about this, the more it just sounds like this is a book that a lot of folks need to guide them through and instead of doing it hit or miss, trying to fix things after they've, they've already broken them once. Um, and, and it sounds like the way it's constructed that you walk them through different projects or ways to achieve different objectives. Yeah, Definitely. I think that's that's very much what we're going for is trying to make sure like, all right, 
So, you know, you, you're sitting down, you're trying to get your family organized. It's, it's a weekend project, whatever. How do you get everybody set up and talking to each other and using all the same technology and sharing what they need to share and keeping private what they need to keep private. And so breaking those out into sort of discrete little chunks and tasks that you can deal with at any given time makes it a lot easier than trying to sit down and like jump in without any idea of where to start or what steps to take or trying to like you know, navigate your way through 8,000 support documents at apple.com. So trying to present this like, you know, here are the steps you need to take for these particular things, I, I think is a really good approach for us to, to be able to share uh, the pitfalls that we ran into or the workarounds that we found and to help everybody kind of figure out, well, how is this going to work for my family setup? And Dan, you know, you brought up, uh, you, it was in passing, but I never really thought of like cousins or that kind of thing being included in a family group. So it it does let you set up, uh, for lack of a better term, maybe layers of family. Well, I mean, there. Is, I think that Apple doesn't necessarily provide that granularity, but you can certainly for yourself figure out who you want to include in the family. I, Apple's not going to judge you based on who you, who's going to be in your family or not. Although it did sound, it started to sound like Survivor a little bit earlier when Dad, Jeff was talking about, you know, who who doesn't get into the family group. Yes, right. <laughs> You're off the island. Um, but for me in particular, I mean, I'm an only child. I have, I'm not married. I don't have any kids of my own yet. So like having a family group is not useful for me, but I have a lot of extended family. Family, many of whom use Apple devices, and we do keep in touch using a lot of these technologies. And we, you know, have iMessage setups, and you know, we like to share photos and things like that. So having the ability to do that for me without having to say yes, these are all members of like my immediate family is really useful. And even in cases where it's like, well, I don't necessarily want my cousins buying apps on my dime, but you know, at least we can still take advantage of some of the other sharing features that that are you know Apple makes available, shared calendars, shared reminders, iMessage groups, and all that stuff. So. I found it particularly helpful for me, even though my family may not be shaped like the the families that Apple is considering, that I could still take advantage of a lot of the features here. And it's also open to, you know, whatever you want to determine as a family. I mean, a family can be, you know, five people sharing the same house, um, you know, as long as you all trust each other to to use one credit card, you know, maybe there's, you know, one, one account that, that, you know, everybody pulls their rent money into or whatever. Um, so, you know, it's, there's no like, you know, background check to say, Hmm, this other person doesn't have the same last name. Like you get to choose that. And there are also controls so that, you know, you can remove somebody from the family and, um, you know, they, they have, there's actually an insane, uh, uh restriction. Let's see if I can, get this right it, like like you can join a family a family share group twice in one year yeah. so if nothing else you want the book to show you how to do it because if you screw up if you screw up twice eh, sorry it's apple you're out of the family for for a year you're out of the family yeah yeah for a year or for good for a year or oh, for a year yeah. okay yeah. settle yeah. all family business well at least you can come back I mean, time to go <laughs> hitchhiking through europe or something because <laughs> uh my head is spinning my head is spinning because there's just there's so many options here and it now i want to go through the book and see what i've done right and what i haven't done right uh, <laughs> we don't judge no, okay. thank you we, we do grade though <laughs> you do. <laughs> it's not really a judge. It's just so you can give it now. Yeah, this, this is a new kind of book with an appendix that has a test at the back. Right? <laughs> I think that's great. I think we should do that next time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the first appendix. The second appendix is don't do any of this stuff with beta software, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, that's a big sticker that we put on the front. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And Dan's picture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't be like this man. Yeah. So where do we go to get this? How much does it cost? You know, we got to go through all those details for everyone. Oh, absolutely. Um, well, you can go to um, Amazon.com, uh, major booksellers. I'm not sure if it's on the 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 shelves uh, today. I think uh, officially it it uh, releases on the 17th, um, and so I, I mean I have copies, so it exists, um, and so now it's just a matter of of distribution. You can get it at um, uh, Peach Pit dot com um you can get it again like i said through amazon um i believe the ebook is already available i would have to double, double check that um and it costs i should uh 29.99 in the u.s 33.99 in canada um and uh peachbit has a, a a special offer code that they gave us um if you go to peachbit.com and order the book there 
Um, you can get it for 35% off with the code Apple Home, all one word. And that that's valid for print and ebook versions. Um, I think one plug for for Peach Pit, there's a like a, a reduced price bundle. So you can get the print version and ebook versions, which include you know a PDF and a Mobi and um, uh, EPUB. So you can put it on any of the devices that you're gonna read about and configure anyway, um, so that you have have it everywhere. And we, and we should, of course, mention that this comes out just in time for the holidays. So if you is it the you, holidays, if, if you're last minute shopping and you need a yes. gift for that Apple fan in your life or you want to make sure that your uh, parents or siblings or children have a clue of what they're doing, makes a great gift. It does make a great gift. Yeah, that's that's great. That that means that you can give the iPads and iPhones and all that stuff on on. The, on Christmas and then the day after, you can use the book to set everybody up. And by New Year's, everything will just be humming along perfectly. I think the um, if you fold it just right, it should fit in a stocking. There you go. <laughs> I haven't tested this yet. Yet. There you go. Yeah, I think yeah. Joe, Joe Kissel and I were having this discussion about how many ebooks fit in a stocking. It's <laughs> An infinite number. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> as many as you want. We haven't figured it out. Well, Jeff, I, I know that you and I are going to be talking soon about another project you've been working on. We'll tease yes. that just a little bit. And so Jeff will be back soon. So thanks for being here as always. Thanks for the work on this, guys. This this is uh, th th I think this will be a very useful book, one that a lot of people will want to invest in. We're hoping so. And, yeah. and you know, as far as we can tell, um, you know, to go out on a limb, I think this is the the first book of its kind that's really bringing all this stuff together. So, um, you know, definitely – Go get it because it's first. Because we're in America, first is important, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it's best. It's and also it's best. best. First and yes. best. First yeah, and I'm comfortable best. saying that. Yeah. First yeah. and best. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, just uh, for another little uh, personal plug, um, it's it's a sharp looking book. Um, it's uh, the 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 template. Um, I know this is inside baseball, but um, uh, I do all the design. Uh, sorry, all of the the production of uh, of the books, and so um, uh, the the design that uh, Peach, Pits, Peach Pits designers came up with is it's it's beautiful. It has lots of full color uh, pictures and screenshots. It's very uh, clear to see what's going on. Um, see if I can find a, a really quick good example. Um, and so it's it's good in the sense that you've got you know like. It's a nice uh, multimedia, um, not multimedia, oh. nice printed um, thing that you can hold and flip through and not think, oh, this is like an another dry, you know, camera manual or something like that. <laughs> so, you know, um, I just want to plug the fact that that it's, it's a beautiful book and um, that has merit. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. And Dan, you know, it's it's funny. I've had a little trouble with with this your side of the interview because I'm not used to responding to you. I hear you in my head all the time on all these other podcasts, but you know, now I get to ask you questions and you actually talk back. This is this is my cleverly constructed Turing bot. It's yeah. not. I'm not even here. I'm You're not, not even here. It's just it's, I'm a, I'm a chat script. So who wrote the book? Oh, oh. <laughs> so, clever. Where else? Well, I know I know a lot of the places, but tell everyone where folks can find you and and your podcasting uh, acumen. Sure. Um, well, of course, I'm on Twitter at dmorin, uh, and I have a number of podcasts. I'm a regular panelist on The Incomparable with Jason Snell and a bunch of other uh, fun technical uh, and Mac folk. Um, I'm also co-hosting a new tech podcast called The Rebound with my former colleague Lex Friedman and John Moltz of a very nice website and um, former Crazy Apple Rumors fame. Um, and I'm also I have a, a movie podcast that Lex and I co-host called Not Playing with Lex and Dan, where we watch movies that we haven't seen before and and talk about them. Uh, and then, of course, Jason Snell and I also have a podcast, a tech podcast called Clockwise. That's a half hour podcast every week with a couple uh, guests. Been on, Jeff's been on the show. Um, and so we uh, we have a good time and we keep it short so that we can sort of hit the high points of the news. And um, that it, somehow that doesn't manage to eat up all my time in the week having all these podcasts i still find time to actually write a few things here and there which is great um but it is um there are a lot of places you can hear me talk if you're really desirous to do so yeah, well there there are a couple of those i listen to and a couple i i haven't subscribed to yet and now i have to because it 
should be just all Dan all the time. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Well, that's from from your lips to God's ears. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and Jeff, uh, your Twitter ha Twitter handle and any other projects you want to plug other than the upcoming book, which we'll talk about next time. Um, I am at Jeff Carlson on Twitter, and you can find me at jeffcarlson.com. dot com. Um, I have a book on uh, Adobe Photoshop Elements thirteen, the classroom in a book that's coming out. Uh, I think right around the same time or very shortly thereafter uh, that we will talk more about. Mm. And um, other than that, I'm, I've been doing a lot of writing for lynda.com, and I still write for the Seattle Times and Macworld, and um, I'm a freelancer, so lots of outlets. Great, great. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you for a great book, uh, and thank you for a great discussion. I think it will inspire a lot of people to go out and, and check it out and maybe try some of this stuff. You know, we don't want to make them afraid of it because uh, it's very powerful. It's very useful. It's just to get it to work the way you want it, you probably need a little guidance. So, thank you. Thank see you, you, Chuck. See you next time. Dan, sometime before 2020, okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll pencil it in. All right, great, great. Folks, check the show notes. Uh, I will have links there to both the bios of these gentlemen to the Peach Pit, Peach Pit site where you can go to get the book. And, of course, with the code. Uh, Jeff, that code is? That code is Apple Home, A-P-P-L-E-H-O-M-E. -E. All lowercase? Um, I have it here all uppercase, but it might not matter. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll make it all uppercase. So, Oh, and it, it expires 12, 31, 16. 16. So I would encourage you not to wait a year to yeah. get it, but you know, <laughs> in case it, it's there just, just in case. Great. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. We will see you next time. Thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and the Mac Voices blog. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date on all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Do more with your Apple tech by subscribing to the free Mac Voices magazine on Flipboard, by visiting macvoices.com slash magazine. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.